Hi, and welcome to The Honest Channel. If you're new here, I'm a journalist with an interest in aging well and exploring the lifestyle changes we can make to help us do that, and looking at the products and treatments that best support it, including the innovations going on around skin health right now. But what I also wanna do is shine a light on the risks that some treatments and products expose us to. So today, I'm returning to the subject of unwanted facial fat loss linked to heat-based clinical and at-home treatments. Now, I've done a few interviews around this subject, which I'll link to here, and they include interviews with doctors on the level of risk involved with clinical and home treatments, and interviews with adipose skincare founder Ivan Galanin, who has been researching the causes of facial fat loss and how to renew it naturally. As a result of doing these interviews, I've had quite a few comments from viewers who've told me they experienced dramatic unwanted facial fat loss following radiofrequency or ultrasound treatments largely done in clinics. Now, more recently, I heard from a viewer who said she'd also experienced significant facial fat loss after using an at-home device. Not a well-known one, I have to say, but I was still shocked by that because the consensus view had been that at-home devices are less powerful and therefore significantly less likely to cause major fat loss. I spoke to this viewer on the phone to find out more. She was 45 at the time she bought a radio frequency device off Amazon for less than $100. That was six years ago. Now, I don't wanna scare people with this video. I think that's a relatively unusual experience and there are lots and lots of people out there happily and regularly using RF devices with seemingly no adverse effects. And likewise, with clinical treatments, the reason they're so popular and widely available is that most people get good results, but not everyone does. And I wanna explore the reasons why and to raise awareness of the risks so we're better informed and so fewer people un end up with unwanted side effects. To do that, I needed to find someone who understood the specific product specs of radio frequency devices. And for that, I looked within the industry itself. Now, it's fair to say most producers of radio frequency devices don't want to talk about risks and fat loss, but in recent years, I've got to know a couple of the team at Even Skin who produce a range of anti-aging devices, including a radio frequency device called the Lumo, which I've used myself. Even Skin Director Zain Ali agreed to talk to me about the issue of fat loss and what it could have been about the device that my viewer used and other similar ones that may have contributed to the fat loss. And we talked about the wider risks in general and what consumers should be aware of if they're thinking of using radio frequency for skin tightening. Now we can't name the specific product used by my viewer for legal reasons because I can't directly prove that it caused that sudden and dramatic fat loss and that it alone caused it, but I certainly believe my viewer. So let's hear from Zain Ali on the technology behind radio frequency devices, choosing one with a safer spec and how to minimize your risks. Zane, um, I want to start by saying a big thanks uh, to you for talking to me about what is not the easiest of subjects. Absolutely. Our pleasure to come on and discuss these topics as we understand them to be as relevant to the audience and, and to, to, to really get them out there fully discussed and uh, explored. So we'll do our best. I think firstly, it would be really helpful just to start by reminding the audience, if you would, how radio frequency works and what it does for our skin. Radio frequency forms this layer um, among other uh, similar technologies like ultrasound um, and potentially on the laser side, the IPL, intense pulse light, where they're considered generally non-ablative which is they're mm -hmm. not taking off layers of your skin. Yeah. And they're generally, you're not injecting anything, so you're not breaking the skin barrier. Um, and so no risk of infection there, that's a plus. Um, however, there's this thing where people go, well, isn't radio frequency used to treat cancers? And, and all these questions get raised too. So with any technology that's out there, radio frequency, just like lasers, just like ultrasound, where you can vary the wavelength, you can vary the frequency, and you can achieve that intended target result. In this case, we're talking about radio frequency being used to tighten skin. Yeah. And again, I just want to be clear that it is, it's part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's just, just how we have visible light and microwaves. Radio frequency is just part of that electromagnetic spectrum. And all it's doing, it's it's in a targeted manner, heating up the skin tissue, causing thermal damage, which then results in the upregulation 
of, of, of collagen production and synthesis. So there is a whole lot more. I mean, we're, we're talking about it in a very simplistic sense. And we say, what is RF? And, and, and mm-hmm. we really need to define this because there's many things that we'll talk about today, potentially, that then get engaged and a lot of devices claiming radio frequency. And then we need to understand what types of radio frequency modalities exist, monopolar, bipolar, multipolar. There's all kinds of complexities. So anyway, I'll, I'll keep it there. And then we can maybe sort of dive down these certain verticals, if you would like, and, and maybe uh, talk about them in more detail. In general, though, it is heating um, the the deeper layers of our skin, would you say? That is correct. So it is why radio frequency has become more popular among manufacturers like us and uh, clinics in general is because it has that unique ability to sort of bypass and have no effect on your topical top epidermal layer. It yeah. goes and has effect because of the properties of the connective tissue and the dermal layer of what is called impedance that it it really has more of that action in that dermal layer and if you can control it and if you can channel it the right way with the right amount of power you can have the best results in terms of production of the collagen and elastin fibers that we start to lose and stop producing as we age. And that is the reason why that scaffolding disappearing underneath your epidermal layer causes your upper layers to show up uh, with wrinkles and fine lines. Formerly, you had these very hot lasers and you had other modalities which potentially were not as directed. So there's there's more development coming down on the radio frequency spectrum, which is why you'll see most of the devices on the market nowadays, the good yeah. ones, are based on radio frequency for the most part, the, the top tier devices. And presumably when you talk about control, that's absolutely, control and targeting is absolutely crucial. But I did just wanna um, look firstly at clinical skin tightening, the, the radio frequency based treatments where there do seem to have been quite significant numbers of people coming forward now to say they've experienced unwanted facial fat loss. And I don't know if you're aware of Dr. Anil Rajani, who is, he's a very popular aesthetic specialist on YouTube. And he said, good machines are capable of doing bad things. So in a clinical setting where you've got one doctor using the machine, and maybe you've got another doctor or maybe somebody Who's, who's not a, a medical practitioner using that exact, exact same machine and different outcomes. I mean, do you have any sense of why that is? I'll, I'll say this. So he's absolutely right. So there is um, a huge potential um, where a huge power potential exists to do harm. Um, just how they say that with great power comes great responsibility. And that is essentially what you're dealing with in a clinical setting where, for example, to compare the Lumo by even skin, the skin tightening mm-hmm. handset uh, is rated at a power of roughly 10 watts. Okay. Right. And same goes for other uh, devices on the market. Ten when watts, you're okay. talking about a commercial machine, they are, their power outputs around a hundred watts. <laughs> Generally speaking, you can tell how powerful a machine is by the number of treatments being recommended per year. But if they're telling you, you only need to come in once or twice a year, that means enough stimulation is being done. Logic says that you will continue to have benefit, right? So that means if you extrapolate it backwards, that whatever is being done in that one treatment is enough to last you six months of collagen growth. If done right, that is fabulous. There is nothing better than that in my view because sophisticated, it's probably leveraging if you go to one of the best clinics, leveraging one of the best machines. But if done wrong, and again, I actually, ahead of this interview, called up a couple of clinics. um, And I actually asked because we weren't sure what they were using as regulation these days to get into um, doing these, um, or, or rather getting people to do these treatments to individuals. And I said, can I have a doctor do this for me, please? Mm-hmm. And consistently the answer is a doctor is present. 
available somewhere in the background, but a trained technician does it. And when you peruse further, when you ask, what does this technician have in terms of a qualification? They have a diploma. What kind of diploma? It's an advanced diploma. And often the, the answers are inconclusive. So, and I, I can tell you, obviously, it even skin, we get these questions a lot from ladies who say, can I help build back collagen where I have lost it on one side of my face because I had an IPL treatment done and at a clinic and the girl turned it up a lot uh, too much or the technician. So, you know, really, truly the potential to do a lot. Again, I'm going to go positive and say it's there with, with commercial machines. There's a lot of hand pieces. There's a lot of modalities. There's a lot of wavelengths. There's a lot of things you can do with one amazing machine. But there's too much power in the wrong hands or if the person's distracted or if they're not trained, the potential to do harm is more magnified because simply put, that 10 watt machine that you're at home, a new uh, tripolar, even skin Lumo, or any of the ones. And again, we're not trying to take sides here. We're just doing a no, comparison. But between, these better known but brands. brands yeah. The better known brands, the more established brands, you will be able to tell that the, the power potentials are limited. And that is why, in a way, that is a con because you're using them once uh, a week, potentially, uh, or, or less. Um, yeah. But in, in the commercial... Uh, you do it less uh, frequently, but the, the power applied is a lot more. So yeah. obviously there's a lot more that goes on. There's pain with clinics, a lot more uh, potential of that operator experience, the patient discomfort, the recovery time is a lot longer. Sometimes it's very ablative because you're doing that one session. It's quite intense. So the yeah. pain, all those factors aside, I would say, you know, why good good machines can do bad things is potentially not because the machine is inherently faulty. Generally, it's because of how it's being done. Is there a lack of training in the industry then, do you think? Um, is that difficult it, to say? It, it would be difficult to say because in, in our experience, at least, it's very sporadic and, 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 and it's done on a uh, clinic basis by clinic. Mm -hmm. So there are certain franchises that do good training sessions with yeah. the manufacturer and with um, an academy and they require certain qualification uh, qualifications. Others will just do on-site training. It's limited. Mm -hmm. And again, it never takes away that, um, you know, variable where you can ask for the doctor, you can ask for a certain technician, but you might still end up with a poorly trained technician. There yeah. is no insurance policy usually that a user has against this. And I think, I will say at this point that people, in my view, do more research, unfortunately, on a Dyson and the Black Friday deal that they might be getting on that than they would um, when they're getting a device that really could alter how their face um, looks 10 years or even five years yeah. down the road. So there is um, that element that people really need to get educated on this and, and really seek out knowledge. And I think the way to do that would be to, again, watch interviews like this. And, and 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 really understand what is it that they should be looking for. Yeah, know the risks, isn't it? And I think as well, I think a telltale sign is if you were um, in an aesthetic clinic and they were recommending radio frequency, and you said to them, "Well, what about the risk of um, facial fat loss?" and they were flippant about it, in denial about it. Oh, that doesn't happen. Don't worry about that. That's not a thing. Um, th th I, that would be a, a red flag. I do think some people are more susceptible to facial fat loss than others. It's an incredibly difficult question because I don't think it's really even been studied. But right, and and that truly, I would agree with you. But but we do know certain things that you know people do have variance in skin thickness. Yes. And that could potentially determine the penetration depth of the um, modality being applied, radio frequency, ultrasound, IPL. And that could then affect where the energy is being applied and how much is being applied. So yes, potentially, hypothetically speaking, if someone was working with a lot thinner skin, they probably mm. want to appreciate that and then yep. work with a lower amount of energy. And this happens all the time. For example, a somewhat... Um, Analogous example would be in the realm of lasers, where someone who is on the side of getting darker of a skin shade, um, for example, if they're a little bit dark brown, 
the technician generally is trained to tone down the intensity so as not to cause hyperpigmentation because the the risks generally with lasers is they they go right through your skin and they can target your melanocytes the melanin yeah. producing cells and there's that risk of PIH in Asian skin for example and in darker skin types that you do get this you know hyperpigmentation mm -hmm. issue so again being trained on those things would similarly I imagine apply when dealing with thinner skin uh, individuals um, and, and just adjusting your apparatus accordingly but then again opting for a at-home skin tightening device you lower the risk no matter what because you are working with lower power to begin with and you can limit yeah. your usage and that that generally was, I mean, I, I've spoken to a, a doctor on this um, channel before, Dr. Chen Xu, and um, that was what she said. That was her view was that at-home devices, uh, they're less powerful, so they're considerably less likely to cause significant fat loss. I was quite taken aback by um, a, a viewer getting in touch who had bought, and I, I, have, I have flagged this particular device to you, we're, we're not going to name the, the device itself because you can never be 100% confident that that device caused directly the facial fat loss. But do you have any sense of what could have happened in a case like this? So I'll start with the caveat that, you know, again, this is a case by case and someone really, you know, with medical training, we need to assess this individual. But that yeah, said, absolutely. That said, um, if we are to just work away at this problem as just as a brainstorming session, we would probably say things like, um, you know, there's a certain heat that is required, for example, to produce new collagen. It's called new, new neocollagenesis, right? So to produce new collagen, you need to hit a certain temperature before um, which you will start to have actual production happen. The LUMO, for example, leverages a higher tier. The studies show that at 60 degrees for a very short period, you actually cause even more production. You cause partial denatur denaturation, collagen being a protein that denatures. So you, you cause it to have a certain amount of denaturation that then causes it to grow faster. Now, we leverage that as a added benefit for a short period, which is why you see results that you do. A lot of commercial machines do this. Now, if we're working with a machine that, say, is cheaper, we could be working with a modality, which is sort of mo monopolar, which most devices don't use these days, like the Lumo uses bipolar, many others use multipolar. What monopolar, um, why it's fallen out of favor is because some of these older technologies, what they do is they they go deeper. The, the mode of action, the profile is deeper. And, 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 and you can see that. And, and in fact, it's held against bipolar with the LUMO users that it doesn't go deep enough. They say it only goes four millimeters, which we see as a positive insurance policy against any unintended fat loss um, that we yeah. rather have limited results than have uh, damaging results. So it could be that it's using that monopolar. It could be yeah. that it is unrestricted in the amount of heat it produces. It's probably thinking more is better. So it's hitting it across, you know, uh, the park, which is to say 80 degrees Celsius, uh, it could be temperatures that you're reaching in the dermal layer, at which point you will have full denaturation of the collagen. And, and denaturation, no, no. sorry, Zane, yes, but yes. what does so, that mean? Denaturation is essentially a protein being becoming ineffective, right? It right. becoming, if you look at the 3D models of proteins, right, and these very cool things, they are, you know, proteins are essentially a bunch of amino acids right? And a bunch of amino acids put together are peptides. And essentially, if you warm them too much, say in a test tube, you will denature them to the point where they are no longer able to bind or be effective or become usable by the body. Okay. So if you denature by too much heat and misdirected heat, I should say, this mm -hmm. is something that we haven't even talked about, right? Yeah. It's, it's really where you know, the silver lining here, that the real, when you parse this issue, right, you really understand that it's how you target the heat and how much heat that is what really becomes relevant. Because yeah. every device out there, a cheap one, an expensive one, they can all produce a lot of heat. It's just how carefully you can place that heat in the intended layer and keep it away from the unintended. So I'm assuming, again, whatever the system involved, I just you know, narrowed it down to monocle. It could be anything else. It could be bipolar. But the way this machine is delivering that heat 
is obviously potentially uh, not uh, efficient, and maybe there is scattering, what they call uh, medical in medical terminology, uh, and the scattering effect, uh, much like you know. Uh, light that scatters out from the clouds that break through the sun, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the break in the clouds and the sun shining through, you will see scattering of light. Think of it like that, right? You might yeah. have it going to this other tissue areas where the heat is now being dissipated and, and transmitted. Because again, law of physics says heat is never destroyed. It mm -hmm. is transformed. So all that heat has to go somewhere and that heat will end up um, going into other tissue, uh, potentially, if there's too much of it, and uh, especially if it's uh, sort of um, uncontrolled in, in, yeah. in, in some regard. And do you think um, that the better known brands on the market, including Even Skin, they are working using different uh, modalities? They are more they are more targeted. Absolutely. I mean, there's a reason why. The devices cost what they do and the companies are constantly trying to work to make it and and our goal at even skin has been to democratize this and make this so that everybody out there can get their hands on one of these devices and it's not to maintain a certain price point but as you can imagine the things that go the ceramics the transistors the chips and all the modalities the sensors so for example the lumo has a sensor built in where if a certain power output is exceeded, which would result in a certain temperature being reached, it automatically lowers it. So it doesn't go into turn off mode, it will automatically detect that and lower that back to the level that it needs to be. So having those things built in requires um, additional circuitry, additional know how additional R&D work, obviously that costs more. And so I know there's no silver bullet here, there's no you know, exactly what you're looking for when you're buying one of these uh, direct response. But generally, I would say for a consumer to peruse, ask, question, inquire, and then get satisfactory answers would be a start. Because oftentimes, the example that you mentioned about the Amazon uh, listing and the person buying it, again, no offense to any Amazon seller, but oftentimes you'll find that they are selling everything um, under the sun and often yeah. cannot answer basic questions about the device. So knowing, finding out the specs, finding out what it uses, finding out if it's reputable, finding out if there are actual video reviews like the ones you've done. And yeah. to be able to see someone who's used it over six, eight, 10 months, we have people who show up in the Facebook comments and they write to us and, and a year goes by, two years go by. So having some long-term you know, um, ability to verify yeah, a temporal, you know, timeline uh, and understand that uh, would be very helpful for someone that is just starting to look for the right device. Far flung countries uh, producing products, selling them um, in Europe and uh, the US and Canada and so on. They're not they're not as tightly regulated, are they? I'd say look for, you know, are they do they even care to register these products? Are they even registered? It, you know, in China, you've got registrations. It's it's, it's yes. just that, yeah. you know, uh, are they complying with those registrations? Every country has registrations, but, and are they legitimate registrations, right? CQC, PES, ROHS, in the European Union, you've got the CE, got the FDA, Health Canada regulates this. So there are a number of regulators out there and device manufacturers will go out and register under the jurisdiction where they want to make this product available for sale. A lot of these products that are coming out of one jurisdiction where, as you said, potentially there's lesser regulation or stringencies attached to the production or sale of these items. And then they'd be shipped into another jurisdiction where mm -hmm. a different standard applies. That is true, that you might find uh, a product that was okay for sale elsewhere, selling somewhere else, where you know they have better regulations however for whatever reason they're not being applied or you know these people who are selling them are not being held to account zane we're running out of time because uh <laughs> zoom kicks us off after 40 minutes um but listen that was that was really helpful for me that gave me a lot more insight um into what could have happened in this situation and the sort of things to look out for as well when we're um looking at um, RF devices and, and considering clinical treatment. So I do appreciate your time. Thank you very, very much. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Claire.
So I hope you found that interview helpful. To summarise what was discussed, if you're thinking of buying a radio frequency device, you can never totally rule out the risk of fat loss. But red flags should wave if you're looking at cheaper products that haven't got approval from your country's safety regulator. Do they give a detailed product spec? Are there a significant number of customer reviews? Are there independent YouTube reviews or similar on that specific brand and product that you can watch or read as well? If you purchase one, I would start on a test area where you can afford to lose fat because I believe some people are more predisposed to this than others. So maybe use it on your jowls for the first month. Keep it on a lower setting and see how you go. I've always thought heat-based treatments are best used on fattier areas anyway. Just not enough is known about them right now and it's clear regulation needs to be tighter across the industry. As for clinical treatments, I'd only consider it with a very reputable aesthetic clinician, a doctor or a nurse who has done these treatments over and over again and could talk knowledgeably and openly about the risks and how they minimise and manage them. On a positive note, I do think there are ways you can help renew the, the lost fat. And the viewer in question at the start of the video recently left a comment on the Adipo interview to say she feels that cream is making a big difference to her. And I've had a few others in similar circumstances say the same thing. I've also had others say red light is helpful. Diet, there are a range of options, so don't despair if it's happened to you. I hope this video helps you make an informed choice. If you've had a positive or negative experience with radio frequency, let us know in the comments because we learn best from each other. Thanks for watching.